Good morning, and welcome to our worship service here today. Remember the old line that sometimes people would say, well, I can't be there physically, but I'll be with you in spirit. And we didn't think that was a very good excuse for being absent from something. Well, today, that's the best excuse we can possibly give. We cannot be together physically, but we are together spiritually. And so I thank you very much for uh, logging on and being with us here today. Thank you for mailing in your donations or donating online. We really appreciate that. We do have bills and salaries that need to be paid, so thank you very much. Now, um, I did a little calculating, and I have been the pastor of this church for 1,952 weeks, or 1,952 Sundays. I've got three more counting today. And I just want to say that on my final Sunday, which will be broadcast beginning uh, May 31st or any time thereafter, uh, I'm actually going to preach the same sermon that I preached on my very first Sunday in this church, December the 5th, 1982, 37 and a half years earlier. So I don't want you to miss it. Please mark it on your calendar and be, be watching, especially on my, and, and that'll be my final day. The following day, I won't be the pastor of this church anymore. I'll be retired. So this will be something of my swan song, and it's going to be the same thing I preached my very first Sunday in this church back in 1982. Well, okay, now let's open our worship service here in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, and we desire to uh, be in fellowship with you in prayer, we desire to worship our Lord Jesus Christ, and we desire to grow as disciples as we listen today to the Word of God. So help us to do all those things through the power of Christ, and we pray in his name, amen. Okay, so now we're going to give you some worship music. Thank you. 
This morning's scripture passage is in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. And let's read that together now. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Would you now join me in prayer together this morning? Father God, as we reflect on those verses, we are also reminded that the coronavirus in perhaps some unique ways, has revealed this inner war that Paul talks about here. Uh, An inner battle that we feel, Lord, that comes to light in in very small things like uh, perhaps eating too much while at home, perhaps rather more significant things like butting heads with one another in our homes, or Lord, even uh, certainly with a increased battling our own temptations, our own uh, depression, perhaps, uh, our own anxieties and fears. Lord, we agree that we are weak. We are weak and we come to you, Lord, uh, for rest in the gospel and also for change. Lord, we believe that you alone can do the supernatural work in our hearts, our warring hearts, to make us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, to help us to grow, to love one another, to have victory over sin in our life, though we still struggle. And so, Lord, we come to you now in prayer as the God who can affect the real change we need, and also as the God who can affect the real change that we need in the world. First in us, Lord, but then also we ask in the world. And this morning as a church, we want to bring before you some particular requests uh, for those within our own congregation. We think, first of all, of uh, the grandson of members of our church uh, who was rushed to the hospital on Friday. We thank you, Lord, that Uh, He is stable and and doing okay right now, but um, Lord, we we pray for healing for him, not just physically, but Lord, uh, certainly also spiritually and emotionally. We also, Lord, want to lift up Barbara Qualls, uh, who's going to be having surgery on her foot Friday, and then Tommy Qualls, who once Barbara recovers, uh, looks like he's going to have to have uh, his foot amputated. So, Lord, the Qualls family is going through an uh, extremely difficult time uh, over the next few months as well uh, as they go through these two surgeries. Lord, please give healing. Please give strength. We also, Lord, want to thank you. Thank you that Bitsy Dom, who um, just over a week ago or so uh, had heart condition uh, issues and they weren't exactly sure what was going on. She was rushed to the hospital Uh, It it does seem now that she's doing okay. And we just pray that uh, this uh, episode she had would would be just that, and it would not be recurring. And Lord, that uh, you'd give Bitsy 
and the doctor's clarity about what's happening with her. And then, Father, once again, we, we continue to lift up before you coronavirus. It, it still weighs on us, obviously. And Lord, perhaps in a unique way over the next few weeks as we see other churches open uh, across the country, and as we, Lord, look with uh, something of jealous eyes, wanting to, to see our brothers and sisters in Christ again, wanting to worship together uh, as one body, uh, physically present, Lord, would you continue to give us patience, continue to give us wisdom, and continue, Lord, to do the same for leadership in this state as they uh, try to push us forward towards meeting together again, moving into the next phase in the recovery from this coronavirus. Lord, now as we open your word together, please bless your servant, Pastor Tom, to our hearts and our minds. Lord, enlighten us, Holy Spirit, to understand uh, the word of Christ to us this morning. And Lord, would we uh, know, would we know that this is the word of God and not the word of man. We pray these things to our triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. Today we're going to study one of the controversial passages in the Bible. Romans 7, 14 through 25, speaks of a person who is unspiritual, a slave of sin, unable to obey God well, unable to do the good things he wants to do, a prisoner of sin, wretched, who hates what he does and keeps on doing evil things. Now, the controversy about this passage is this. Is it describing a Christian or a non-Christian? Wonderful Bible teachers come down on both sides of that debate. My own personal conviction is that this does describe a Christian. Now, in the course of my teaching here this morning, I'll explain why, but for starters, let me give you three reasons. First, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this passage, uh, speaks the, uses the personal pronoun I 27 times. So he's obviously talking about himself. The other side would say, well, sure, but he's talking about himself before he came to Christ, before he was a Christian. Well, that brings me to my second reason for rejecting that view. And that is that throughout this passage, Paul speaks in the present tense. There's never the sense of, this is the way I used to be before I became a Christian, but I'm not that way anymore. Instead, he constantly talks in the present tense as if to say, this is the way my Christian life is. And then third, the Christian life is all about spiritual warfare. And this passage gives us some, a, a, a glimpse into the battles that rage inside of us. My title for today's sermon is, When You Feel Like You're Losing the War. And sometimes that is the way our spiritual warfare uh, feels. Now, in my mind, those three pieces of evidence prove that Romans 7, 14 through 25, describes a believer. Let's see if it describes you. I invite you to test your Christian faith by answering six questions that this passage asks of you. So here's the first question. Do you admit that you're a sinner? Paul begins in Romans 7, 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. We don't think of Paul as unspiritual, but that's the way he thought of himself. He was referring to his human nature, and there's nothing spiritual about that. People who call themselves spiritual are usually very unspiritual, and those who are truly spiritual know themselves so well 
that they refer to themselves as unspiritual. Now, we would call the prophet Isaiah a man of God. But when he sized up his life, he said in Isaiah 6, 5, I am a man of unclean lips. The Living Bible has Isaiah saying in that verse, I am a foul-mouthed sinner. The examples of Paul and Isaiah teach us that even the best of people are people at best. As long as we're in these bodies, sin will infect us right down to the core. The Apostle John understood that when he wrote, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That's 1 John 1, 8. Now, not only did Paul admit that he was unspiritual, he also said he was sold as a slave to sin, verse 14. Before Paul became a Christian, he had the exact opposite opinion of his spiritual condition, for he considered himself faultless. He said so in Philippians 3, 6. Do you see the irony the more sinful we are, the blinder we are to our sin, and the holier we become, the more we notice how far we fall short of God's glory. George Whitfield was a godly evangelist in the 18th century. He once remarked, When I see myself, I seem to be half devil and half man, and I wonder why the people who hear me preach don't stone such a vile wretch as myself. How about you? You profess to be a Christian, but do you also admit that you're a sinner? Some Christians believe that you can reach a level of holiness after which you'll never sin again. A man once told me he hadn't sinned in over 20 years. I knew... <laughs> His wife wouldn't back him up <laughs> on that claim. Since even the Apostle Paul was unspiritual and sold as a slave to sin, the best of Christians cannot claim to be free from sin. If there was someone in church history more godly than Charles Spurgeon, I don't know who it was. But listen to what Spurgeon said about himself and every Christian. He says, our prayers have stains in them. Our faith is mixed with unbelief. Our repentance has something in it we need to repent of. Our fellowship is distant and interrupted. We cannot pray without sinning. There is filth even in our tears. Wow, that is profound. Well, the Apostle James sums up my first point when he wrote on behalf of every Christian, we all stumble in many ways, James 3, 2. Now let's listen to the second question this passage asks us. Do you hate sin? The Apostle Paul went on to say, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate... I do. What Paul wanted to do was obey God perfectly, and what he hated was his sin. Every Christian is just like Paul. We hate to wander away from our Lord, yet we do it anyway. We hate to think of our heart growing cold toward Jesus and his people, but that's exactly what it does. We hate to be lazy in our spiritual disciplines, but we are. We hate pride and love humility, yet pride still rears its ugly head in our lives and humility easily slips through our fingers. A Christian then is like a car with its wheels out of alignment. As long as you grab the steering wheel, you can, you can Aim that car straight down the road, and it'll go straight down the road. But as soon as you let the car drive itself, it will swerve off the road 
every time because its wheels are out of alignment. In the same way, as long as Jesus is the driving force in our lives, we can go down that straight and narrow path of obedience. But as soon as we insist on driving our own lives, steering our, ourselves, we will drift into the path of sin every time. That's human nature for you, and every Christian has it. Now, the word hate in this 15th verse implies that the difference between a believer and a non-believer is that only the believer hates sin. Evangelist Billy Sunday once remarked, I'll kick sin as long as I've got a foot, and I'll fight it as long as I've got a fist. I'll butt it as long as I've got a head, and I'll bite it as long as I've got a tooth. When I'm old and toothless, I'll gum my sin till I go home to glory and it goes home to hell. Wow. Billy Sunday hated sin. Do you? Now, suppose you walk into your home and the first thing you see is a smoking gun on the floor. You go a little farther in and around the corner, there's one of your family members dead from a gunshot wound. Okay, for the rest of your life, whenever you remember the sight of that smoking gun on the floor, it will call up feelings of hatred and anger and disgust because it murdered your loved one. Your sin murdered Jesus whom you love. And that's why it's natural for a Christian to hate sin because it, it murdered the, the Lord we love. And therefore, you can judge the authenticity of your faith in Christ by asking yourself, do I hate sin? Now we're ready for the third question. Do you delight in God's law? Paul goes on to say in verse 16, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. The person with whom Paul agreed was God. God said his law was good, and Paul replied, Amen, yes it is. Now, the non-Christian disagrees with God about that. He or she says that God's law is either too strict, sheer nonsense, or out of date. We shouldn't be surprised at such responses, for in the next chapter of Romans, we'll read, the non-believer does not submit to God's law. But the Christian does submit to God's law in the sense of agreeing with God that it is good. Paul went on to say in verse 22, For in my inner being I delight in God's law. God's law convicted Paul of his sin and then drove him to Christ, so he delighted in it. God's law also showed Paul his heavenly Father's will, and that caused him to delight in it. Now, how about you? Do you delight in Scripture and its commands? And uh, if you do, doesn't it make sense that you will enjoy reading your Bible. I discovered this delight when I was 18 years old. I thought to myself, okay, with God's help, in seven years, I'll graduate from college and seminary, and then I'll be a pastor. So therefore, it's high time that I started studying the Bible every day right now. And so I came up with a plan to read the Bible cover to cover at least once uh, every year. And so I disciplined myself to do that. And I discovered that I could read the whole Bible cover to cover at the rate of just 15 minutes a day. So I, I got into that groove. And then the blessing came. Every morning I'd have my yellow marker in hand and I would highlight verses 
in my Bible that hit me right between, uh, right between the eyes. And for the rest of the day, I would meditate on things I had read in the Bible that day, and it was just so exciting. Now here I am, many, many years later, and I still look forward to and cherish my time in God's Word every morning. And sometimes, too, when it comes to doing Bible study in order to prepare for messages that I give in this church, sometimes I say to myself, they pay me to do this? There isn't anything in the world I would rather do. <clears throat> well, God's law tells us to forgive others. Do you delight to show forgiveness? Or would you rather nurse a, a grudge? The Bible commands us to worship God. Do you delight to join with your spiritual brothers and sisters in singing praises to your Lord? Or is worship a burden to you? Do you feel pleasure in obeying God's will? Or do you resent the Lord for forbidding you to follow your own will? If you delight in God's law, you have good reason to believe that you really are a child of God. Now for the fourth question this passage asks you. Do you feel like a walking civil war? Over the years, many Christians have told me they feel guilty about the struggles with sin that rage in their hearts. Some even doubt their salvation because they feel a terrible conflict between good and evil inside them. I always reply, the conflict you feel is evidence that you are a Christian. Non-believers have no new nature to pull them in the direction of holiness, so they don't feel any inward battle. Only a Christian has both an old nature and a new nature, and they will always be at war with each other. The Apostle Paul shared about his own civil war in verse 17. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. That may sound like Paul was making an excuse, but he was only stating that he had two natures inside him, one that sinned and one that didn't sin. Paul had a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde living inside him, and so does every Christian. He continued in verse 18, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. That's the death blow to the popular idea that human nature is basically good. What then is so bad about human nature? It prevents us from carrying out the desires our new nature has to glorify Christ. For evidence of that, look at Paul's next comment in verse 18. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. The new nature God has given us desires to be faithful to Christ. But like Peter, who disowned Jesus, we often let him down. We want to pray with pure motives, but our motives are always mixed. We want to repent of our sins, but another part of us tells us to hold on to them. Again, Paul says, For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. An example of the good we want to do is to love God with all our hearts. But we do the evil thing by growing cold toward him. We want to do the good thing of loving others, but we do the evil thing by feeling indifferent toward them and sometimes even bitter against them. Now look at verse 20. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. <clears throat> 
The new Paul in Christ wanted to obey God, but the old Paul obeyed sin. So I find this law at work, Paul says. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Verse 21. When you want to pray, a little voice inside you says, you've got better things to do. And when you do pray, impure thoughts distract you. When you want to watch for answers to your prayers, you overlook them. When you want to claim God's promises, doubt tells you they will never be yours. When you want to repent, your old nature comes up with excuses for your sins. When you want to share your faith, another part of you doesn't want to share it. Paul continues now in verses 22 and 3. For in my inner being I delight in God's will. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. Here Paul speaks of the two forces inside him. These two forces are your old sinful nature and your new divine nature. Paul says they are waging war against each other. This pictures the civil war that rages inside every Christian. On February the 4th, 1974, a group of urban guerrillas, calling themselves the Symbionese Liberation Army, kidnapped a 19-year-old girl named Patty Hearst. Two months later, they robbed a bank, and there was Patty Hearst among them holding a rifle in the course of the bank robbery. A year later, the FBI captured Patty Hearst. A year after that, 1976, she stood trial on charges of bank robbery. Patty Hearst said that she participated in that bank robbery against her will and only because they threatened her with death if she didn't. But the jury didn't buy it. The jury convicted Patty Hearst of bank robbery and sentenced her to 35 years in prison. Later, President Bill Clinton pardoned Patty Hearst. And Bill Clinton said, the real Patty Hearst did not rob that bank. That was the Patty Hearst who was a prisoner of a terrorist group. Every Christian is a Patty Hearst. We, we have in, inside of us uh, the, the old nature and the, the new nature. And this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he says that uh, he, it's not the real Paul who's committing these sins, but it's the, the old Paul. Now, an anonymous Christian speaks of the two natures inside us as follows. We are somewhat like the sausage, very smooth upon the skin, but others cannot tell exactly how much hog there is within. <laughs> well, sometimes the truth is, is funny. <laughs> Edwin Martin also speaks of this inward struggle when he wrote, Within my earthly temple there's a crowd. There's one of me who's humble, one who's proud. There's one who's brokenhearted for his sins. There's one who, unrepentant, sits and grins. There's one who loves his neighbor as himself. <clears throat> There's one who cares for naught but health and wealth. Now, how about you? Do you have those two people living inside of you? And if you do, I, I hope you do, because only the Christian does. Now, for the fifth mark of a Christian, here's the fifth question. Does sin make you miserable? 
Paul agonized so much over the battle that raged inside him that he shouted, What a wretched man I am! Verse 24. This reminds me of John Bunyan, author of Pilgrim's Progress. He said he wished God had made him a rat, a lizard, a snake, anything better than a sinner. Like Paul, John Bunyan agonized over the sinful nature that prevented him from obeying God as much as he wanted to. As for Paul's word wretched here in Romans 7, 24, four Bible versions translate it miserable, two other translators, translations render it unhappy, and still another agonizing. The message translation quotes Paul as saying, I'm at the end of my rope. Earlier in Romans, Paul wrote that non-believers, far, far from feeling wretched, miserable, unhappy about their sins, not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them, Romans 1.32. If we confront unbelievers with their sins, they excuse themselves by saying, nobody's perfect, or at least I'm not as bad as the next guy, or I'm doing the best I can, or I'm just trying to be true to the person your God made me. Some of them even take pride in their wretched condition. How do you look at sin? As no big deal? As something harmless? Or does it make you feel miserable, unhappy, and at the end of your rope? If the latter, congratulations, you have good evidence that Christ lives inside you. Now for the final question in this passage. Do you want to be holy? With all his depravity in view, Paul asked in verse 24, who will rescue me from this body of death? Imagine having a dead body strapped to you all day long. No matter where you go, you can't rid yourself of its stench. Its cold and decaying flesh feels creepy on your skin. That's how Paul felt about his sinful human nature. He knew he still had it, but it felt like a corpse he had to carry around with him. He needed someone to rid him of that body of death. Non-Christians, however, don't smell any foul odors, odors because their sense of smell doesn't work. The decaying flesh of their sinful nature that they carry around doesn't feel creepy to them because, according to Ephesians 2.1, they themselves are dead in their sins. The Living Bible translates Paul's question this way. Who will free me from my slavery to this deadly lower nature? Non-Christians don't want freedom from their sinful nature. They like what it gives them. The believer, however, has an appetite for holiness. More than that, he or she knows where to find it. Like Paul, the Christian will say, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, verse 25. The informed Christian knows better than to strive for holiness. The secret is to look to Christ and to trust him for it. The believer then desires holiness and trusts in Christ alone to build it in him or her. When Jim Elliott was in his 20s, he became a missionary to the Aka Indians of Ecuador. Soon after he arrived to share the gospel with them, they murdered him. In his teenage years, Jim had written in his journal, I am dwelling in a generation to whom nothing is holy. Sacredness is an aspect people never assume toward anything. I feel it affecting me. Oh, to be holy, just to sense for a moment that I have somehow, however small, simulated some measure of your character, Lord Jesus. Does that sound strange to you? 
It shouldn't if you're a Christian. We are the bride of Christ and therefore we should love him. We're the body of Christ, so we should serve him. We're the temple of God and therefore we should live for his glory. It should be normal then for us to want to be holy. Now into my action step. The last sentence in Romans 7 summarizes the dilemma in every Christian. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Here again, Paul spoke of the conflict between his new nature and his old sinful nature. Every Christian bears the scars of this same conflict. Now, in light of that fact, here is my action step for you today. Here's what I want you to do. Feed your new nature and starve your old nature. Now, a, um, a missionary was explaining to a new convert that he now had two natures inside of him, his sinful human nature and the new nature that the Holy Spirit had just given him now that he believed in Christ. And the missionary went on to say, it's like two dogs inside of you, a good dog and a bad dog, and they're always fighting. The new convert asked, which dog wins? The missionary thought for a moment and said, the one you feed the most. An anonymous Christian put that same lesson into these words. Two natures beat inside my breast. One is foul, one is blessed. One I love, one I hate. The one I feed will dominate. Boy, that, that hits it right on the head, doesn't it? So, feed your new nature the milk and meat of God's word. Satisfy it with plenty of worship. Nurture it in prayer. Build it up by telling others of your Lord. Make it strong by exercising it in service to Christ. Surround yourself with the fellowship of people who love Jesus. In these ways, you can feed your new nature and help it to grow strong. But you also need to starve your old nature. You can do that by marking as out of bounds, sexually explicit movies, TV programs, photographs, and reading material, as well as gossip, slander, and addictive substances. You can refuse to unite with people who are moving in the opposite direction from Christ. Deprive yourself of anything that would lead you away from your Lord. Now, even if we pass the six tests of genuine Christian faith listed in this passage, even if we answer yes to all these six questions, we have lots of room for spiritual growth, don't we? Though we admit we have a sinful nature, we may have a tough time confessing some sins. Uh, yes, we hate sin, but we don't hate it enough. We're sure we delight in God's word, but then why does it gather dust on the shelf? True, we're involved in a battle with sin on the heart level, but Sometimes we're not sure whose side we're on. Yes, sin makes us feel wretched, so wretched that we sometimes don't claim our forgiveness in Christ. And as for desiring holiness, that's a struggle for us too, isn't it? So, God is still working on you and me. Let's continue to do our part then by constantly feeding the new nature and starving the old nature. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the new nature you give us in Christ, so different from the old sinful nature that just drove us away from you and put us under your judgment. <clears throat> 
Thank you, Lord, for the presence of the indwelling Christ in our hearts. And we pray that you would give us grace and skill and wisdom to feed our new nature and to starve our old nature, that we might live for the glory of our Lord Jesus. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Now we're going to have a closing song, and it comes from uh, Pastor Rick's ordination service about seven years ago, right here in this church. It's a trio, and the three people singing, you'll recognize one of them. It's Pastor Rick's wife, Laura Fodrell. And the other two you might not remember, but they are Laura's brother and sister. So this took place right here on this platform, and it was recorded. And uh, so here then is our, our closing worship song. <laughs>
And now receive the benediction. Today's benediction is Aaron's blessing from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord God the Father bless you and keep you. The Lord God the Son make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord God the Holy Spirit lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace both now and forever.